The last two months have been some of the most testing months I've ever been in in my life. How, how about you? Come on, why don't you write it down in the comments section. It's been a test. It's been a test. There's a quote that says, you don't know what you got till it's gone. I believe it was the band Cinderella, one of those hair bands from the 80s that said, don't know what you got till it's gone. <laughs> oh, and I have a feeling that will be a sound bite that <laughs> is going to be played in the staff meeting. Oh, boy. Happy birthday. But you don't know what you got till it's gone and how many people you miss the simple things of life. You miss being in church. Come on, can you write it down if you miss being in church? Let's interact this morning. Come on, let's, let's get the blood flowing. How many people miss being in church together? How many people miss seeing the big screen behind me? How many people miss seeing John Grimma dead center in the front row? How many people miss seeing, miss seeing the faces and the hugs? What do you miss most about church? I miss most about church is, is the fellowship. You know, because we can, we can, you can hear a message and I could preach a word, but I miss the interaction. I miss the fellowship. And, and just like that, it was all taken away from us. Not only that, but the ability to go to a baseball game or watch sports. It's like everything was just taken away from us. And, and you know, it's funny because that hasn't happened for at least uh, almost 100 years since the Spanish flu. You know, but, but the reality is, is that now we're living with what everybody calls a new normal. I love those, um, those, those commercials where it's just one piano note. Do, 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 do. We're all living in a new normal. We've all had to make sacrifices. And our homes have become our offices, our classrooms. But here at Liberty Mutual, we understand. With the COVID-19 response, if I have to hear another one of the COVID commercials, every, it's all everybody just trying to make money. They really don't understand. But how many people know Jesus understands? Let me make a commercial for you. Do, do. Jesus understands, period. But it's amazing how even just driving we took for granted. And um, I think we can all say, now that it's been a while, we all took for granted the simple things. We all took for granted being together. We all took for granted what we could have went to any Sunday. We relied on the weekly services to fill us up for the week and then and top us off in the tank. And then we did a little bit of devotions and prayer. But now that it's gone, now that we don't have what we used to have, which we could arbitrarily say, how about this? Oh, let's, let's skip church today so we can catch up on some housework. Do you realize even that was, a, was, a, you know, a, was something that we had? And now it's all been taken away. Why? Because now, now, you know, in a lot of respects, I believe God did that for a reason. Because, because a lot of people come to church and a lot of people come to God when things are bad or they need that spiritual tip-off. But, but friends, I'm going to ask you something. Now that we're post the COVID scare, I understand it's still there. But are you still as connected to God as you were in, you, as you were in March? When you were afraid that you were going to get it, you were afraid that you were going to die, you didn't know what was going to happen to your job, you didn't know what was going to happen to the economy. Are you, are you holding on to the horns of the altar right now as much as you were in March? And that's why we're praying and fasting. Because praying and fasting refocus us, refocuses us back to having Jesus in our sights. It shouldn't take... A, a global pandemic to drive us to our knees to spend time with Jesus. But I thank the Lord that he ruffled our feathers and he got us out of the neck, out of the nest. To get our attention to turn back to him. And not in the way that a jealous spouse would manifest disdain for the attention of a husband or wife. Uh, losing focus on the relationship. God's jealousy is different than man's jealousy. I believe God ruffled our feathers because God will find a way to ruffle your feathers because he genuinely loves you. And he sees our situation as a threat to our destiny and our well-being if we do nothing about it. And the reason that you're uncomfortable and the reason that God put you out the nest and the reason why you've gone through this thing and you're wondering, God, where are you, is because he's ruffled your feathers and he's put you out of your comfort zone because he realizes if you stayed in the comfort zone, you'd die. 
He didn't send COVID to judge us. And the devil sure didn't send it to kill us. COVID came in, and God could use anything to motivate and move his church. And I'm grateful that the doors of this church were shut because it forced me to look within myself to see why I was really doing what I'm doing, why I'm really serving who I'm serving. And I believe it's not just me that God was looking into. He's looking into you. And, and, and what was the reason you came to church? And what was the reason you wear that cross of gold on your neck? And what was the reason you lifted your hands in worship? What was the reason you volunteered? And I'm not saying that we had bad reasons, but sometimes we get out of focus, don't we? And sometimes we lose sight of what's really important. Sometimes we, we look at relationships out of what we can get rather than what we can give. I would give anything to be able to give to somebody in person right now. And sometimes God has to flip the world upside down for you to look up. And that's okay. But realize Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. And I'm not here to make any prophetic statements. I'm not here to fully analyze the last two months as, we, as we've been displaced by this pandemic. But I am here to tell you what the Lord has told me for the people who he's entrusted into my hands. And I have a word for this house. Are you ready to receive it? As it happens with the whole church, it happens to you. That's the word he gave us in the beginning of the year when we did our first fast. As it happens with the whole church, it will go with the body and the members. In Deuteronomy 32, 11, it says this, Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. I, 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 I heard Tommy Barnett tell a story about an eagle and, and it's so awesome. And, it, and, and this verse kind of gives you an insight into the eagle. So, so a mother eagle will give birth to the eaglets. And the eaglets will be in the nest. The nest of an eagle is, is on the top of a mountain. It's real high. And there comes a time where the feedings are over. There comes a time where the nursing stage is over. And that nest is filled with all kinds of fluffy things and insulation to keep the, the, uh, the eaglets warm. But then all of a sudden, the mother eaglet, one day before the chicks wake up, will take her beak and throw all the fluffiness out of the nest that all that's left is the hard twigs and matter that made up that nest. And when the little eaglets wake up, they realize their blankie's been taken away. Their whoopee if you follow Kenny from Mr. Mom. <laughs> and the little eaglets wake up and say, wait a minute. The, the nest didn't look like this last night. What's happening? And they realize Mom looks a little angry. And the mother eagle will take one of the eaglets in her beak, go to the edge of the nest, and then all of a sudden drop that little eagle. Now, some of you animal lovers are like, that's so cruel. We need to get picket signs. Justice for eagles. Justice for eagles. You see, before you get too judgmental, you need to realize there's a purpose in the pain. And I'm saying that to you right now as you've been dropped off a cliff and you're looking at God and you're saying, God, why would you do this to me? How could you allow this to happen to me? Why is this happening to me? As you are death dropping. But what does the Bible say? It hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. The mother eagle will drop the eaglet, and the eagle has one of two choices, fly or die. You see, because if the little eagle was allowed to stay in the nest, it would never learn to use its wings. It has to be put under hardship, it has to be dropped off a cliff so that it realizes, wait a minute, these things that I have on the side of my body are not just for pointing at my brothers and sisters. I got, I got to flap them. I got to do exactly what I saw the mother do. And, and, and if he doesn't, guess what the mother eagle does? Catches the eagle, brings him back up right before the eagle hits the ground. The mother eagle swoops in, catches the eagle, brings him back to the top of the nest, and repeats the process until the eagle learns. And that's exactly what God is doing to you right now.
He's taken the comfort out of the nest. He's told you it's time to move. He's told you it's time to grow. He's told you it's time to soar. There are muscles that you have that have not yet been used. There's spiritual insight that you have not yet tapped into. There are dimensions with the Father that you have not been yet, and the only way he can get you there is to push you and get you out of your comfort zone. So I choose to believe this whole COVID situation was God taking the comfort out of the nest and ruffling us up to move us to our destiny. You can't go back to who you used to be. That person doesn't exist anymore. We cannot go back to the church that we were in January and February. Oh, we were a great church, but, he's, but, but would you rather be a church that has wings but doesn't know it? I'd rather be a church that has wings and use them. I'd rather be a person that has wings and use them. Could you imagine an eagle fully grown just walking on the floor like a pigeon? <laughs> Listen, I'm getting desperate. You're not a pigeon. Pigeons, they got limited flying. They fly. They, I, know they, I know Mike Tyson's got pigeons. They can fly in roofs and all that stuff but eagles can soar. They can go higher than the rest of the birds. They can look straight into the sun and it not bother them. He has called you. He, in the Bible, he has reminded you that you're an eagle. They that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. Come on, is there anybody listening? All five of you, can you say amen? Perspective is everything. And so when I started to complain and think about God, why is this happening? The Lord brought me to Israel. And they were in the 70-year captivity to Babylon. That were a result of their spiritual disobedience for multiple generations. In Deuteronomy 8, 19 and 20, it said this, Before they entered the promised land, If you ever forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations of the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. And the people of Israel in the time of Nehemiah were on the tail end of everything that was happening. They were under God's judgment. And this is exactly what they did. They forgot the Lord, and as a result, the Lord loved them enough to correct them. You see, for hundreds of years, God was pleading with them to return back to him. But they, they couldn't. They didn't. They refused. They had spiritual idolatry. They had a form of godliness but denied its power. They would go to the temple on Saturday, but then they would live however they wanted on Monday. And it's funny because I think in our culture today, we have a form of Christianity, but we deny the power of God. We, we like a little bit of Jesus, but as long as it doesn't interfere with our finances. We, we got a little bit of Jesus as long as it doesn't interfere with our career. It, we got a little bit of Jesus as long as it doesn't interfere in the choice of who I live my life with or how I live my life. I'm a good person, but I'm going to tell you something. Good is not good enough to get into heaven. He needs surrender, and he needs you to make him your Lord. And so after hundreds of years of God pleading with his people to turn back to them, he had to get to the ultimate resort of discipline. He caused Babylon to come in and destroy the temple, the walls, and the whole city, and then they took the whole nation captive. It was a second slavery. So now, through the prophets, the return is prophesied. And if you look in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Persian Empire defeats the Babylonian Empire as God prophesied through his prophets, and it's all documented in the prophetic books, and the exiles, the remnant, is allowed to come back home to their home. But their home is different. You know, I wonder what it's going to be like when we finally get back in the sanctuary. It's going to be different. There's going to be people wearing masks. It's funny because years ago when Michael Jackson wore a mask, we thought he was a freak. <laughs> Little did we know Michael Jackson, he, he pretty much knew more than we did. <laughs> Chamon. Oh, that hurt. 
Billie Jean. But the first group of people that are allowed to come back into the promised land through the return was Ezra and a band of exiles that came back to rebuild the temple. And then after them, Nehemiah came in with a band of exiles to come back and rebuild the wall. But there was a remnant. I want you to type that word in, remnant. There's a remnant. And I will tell you this, God will always leave a remnant. God will always leave a remnant, and God will always use a remnant. The remnant God leaves is the remnant that God will use. And friends, I've got to believe that not everybody who came to church is going to church anymore. I believe as we've been scattered, there's some that have probably gone away, and there's some that aren't watching as regularly or whatever the case is, and that's fine. We'll go after them, and we'll find them, and we'll, we'll bring them Jesus, but man, there's a remnant, and I'm going to say something right now. If you're watching with me right now, you are the remnant God is going to use to bring revival back to the land. You are, you are the remnant God is going to use to bring revival back to the church. You are the remnant God is going to use to move into the new church, into the new ministry. And you are the remnant that God is going to use to manifest anointing and blessing in your family. Can somebody say amen? How many people like sourdough bread? Sourdough bread, they have something called the starter. And one lady, the starter is, is the original yeast. And one lady had a starter that was 122 years old. That means for 122 years, it was this same yeast that she was using to make the bread. Everything in sourdough needs that starter. And when it comes to revival, God will have a starter ready-made to come in and manifest and mold with the regular so that revival can come in. Come on, how many people say that? I'm the remnant. God's going to use me. I'm the starter. Come on, how many people know God's got the remnant plugged all throughout the land? God's got the remnant all throughout Next City Church. God's got the remnant all in families. God has the remnant all in houses. You are the remnant, and God is going to use you to start something because he's going to do something in you now that's going to manifest for eternity. He's ruffled your feathers so that you can soar like you've never soared before. And Nehemiah in chapter 8 documents one of the greatest revivals in the Bible. After he comes back to the city, rebuilds the wall, as he rebuilds the temple, they gather the people together. In Nehemiah 8, 1 through 9, this is where we're going to read. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month of Ezra, the priest, the seventh month Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who can understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. And Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform uh, uh, built for the occasion. And besides him on his right hand stood Mattahiah, Shena, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. And on them, on his left was Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem. Oh, man, look at these names. Hashabada, Zechariah, Bashula. Man, this ain't easy. This is mentally taxing. <laughs> and Ezra opened the book, and all the people could see him, and he was standing above them. And he opened it, and the people all stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen and Amen. And they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, she, 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 oh my, here's another list of people. Get to the end of the names. They instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. You see, what we see here is a people 
who saw generations die in captivity. They knew of the sins that their forefathers had created. But when they come into this situation, they, they, were, they were like second generation uh, uh, children of immigrants. For instance, like with Rachel, her father comes from Italy, but she don't speak a lick of Italian. So who's more Italian? Me or her? Yes, I took Italian in junior high school. Parlo Italiano. Well, just because you do this, you think you're Italian? Uh, anyway. Anyway. But you know how it is with like when, when, you, when you have immigrant parents and, and the second generation comes in, and so the first generation can speak it, but the second generation... So, so I want you to understand that when, when they read the, the, the word of the Lord in Hebrew, they were speaking Aramaic at that time. Th their whole identity got wiped out. And all they knew of was the sins of their forefathers. And all they could really hear was the traditions that were handed down to them, which were a little cloudy. They knew of God, but they, they really didn't have the relationship. And so when they come back into the temple and they read the law, there's these people who are translating it to them now. The priests are translating it to them now, and they begin to weep because they realize what they missed, and they realize how good God is, and they realize that his word applied to every area of our life. In verse 1, the catalyst of revival is a result of renewed emphasis on his word, prayer, and confession of sin. Genuinely and humbly, repentance, rejection of sinful behaviors of society, and a renewed commitment to follow God's plan. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, I will come down from heaven and heal their land. Revival cannot come without repentance. And friends, as your, as your feathers have been ruffled, as we are in this new normal, as we are in this time where we can't get together with friends and family, what are you going to do? Are you, are you going to complain about what we don't have? Or are you going to take the time to allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart and to look inside of you? And would you put yourself on the potter's wheel over the next week where God can take out the sin and the flesh and the selfish desires and the anxieties and the fears and the suicidal thoughts and the tendencies and the things that are not of God because God wants to change you. He doesn't want you to go back to the sanctuary or back to work or back to your family parties the same. There's revival, but revival cannot come without a renewed focus on his word. And what is prayer and fasting? It's time in the word. It's time in prayer and it's time in his presence. Listen, come on, let me be real with you. What is it that still exists in you that you've been trying to get rid of for years, but you failed it's time to soar it's time to use those wings but those wings are clipped if you hold on to the things that God says are no longer part of your life revival cannot happen without repentance a renewed focus into the word of God because when, when the priests and, and the Levites and, and the people read the word of the Lord, they started to realize they were not living by this in their previous life. They were not following this. And they said, oh, Lord, we missed it. We missed it big time. And they began to cry because they remembered their sin. But they also encountered, once they got into this word, they weren't just reminded of where they missed the mark. They were reminded of the grace and the mercy of God. And if there's anything this season has done, it stripped us down to what's most important. But will we stay here or will we get back to who we used to be? If you lived through 9-11 and you were part of the city, you realize that when the planes hit the towers, we had church services that were packed. Well, look at the world now, before COVID. Look at the things that have happened that have been so against this word. The killing of the unborn regularly. That in this season, abortion is seen as a necessity. An essential service. Look at what's happened in the world where people don't even understand their identity. They don't know who they are, so they, 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 will, they will try and create who they think they are. It's because they haven't looked into the word of God to see whose they are. Because when you know whose you are, then you'll know who you are. We've strayed. And we've strayed as a church to think that, you know what, we can accept that in other people. That truth is relative. Well, if it's true for you, it, it, then I, I respect that. Live your truth. No, 
live his truth. You see, that's what's happening to the people. They realize they traded the truth of God for a lie. And they started to say, wait a minute, this word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And they were crying because they were so blessed by it, but they were also so challenged by it. And they surrendered and said, Lord, when we come back into this land, we're going to do it your way. In verse 3, once the nation started to renew their focus on God and his word, the fog of captivity was lifted and the Holy Spirit moved among his people. It was not just a desire to be in church. It was a resolve to stay, to, to, to say the word is the only way that applies to our lives, privately and corporately. And the Bible says in that passage that I read to you from Nehemiah chapter 8 that the word was read seven days a week and six hours a day. What are we going to do for the next seven days? We're going to read his word and we're going to fast physical food. Amen? We're going to read his word. We're going to pray. We're going to worship. We're going to come together for services. And for the next seven days, this is going to be our bread. This is going to be our meal. What do you think can happen that for seven days we could focus on God and his word and in his presence? God's going to do something. Jesus said in John 6, 35, it says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This week, it's about making Jesus the main dish. I don't want to go back the same pastor. I don't want to go back the same husband. I don't want to go back the same father. I don't want to be the same son. I don't want to be the same brother. I want to be changed. And the only way I could be changed is to surrender myself to the Lord, put myself on the potter's wheel, offer my body as a living sacrifice and say, Lord, more than physical food, I want to eat from the bread of life. I want to make you the main dish because God is going to transform you if you surrender to his process. One of the greatest proofs of revival is a deep spiritual hunger to hear, read, and apply God's word in a personal life. Listen, you are what you eat. And usually what you eat manifests on the outside. If what you eat is good, it will bless your insides, and it will manifest on the outsides. How many people know the Bible says, <laughs> out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth flows? God has everything that we need. And in verse 5 and 6 of, of the book of Ezra, chap, I'm, I'm sorry, Nehemiah chapter 8, it says, Ezra opened the book, and all the people could see him, that he was standing over them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. That talks about an honor for the word of God. Why do we stand for the word of God? Because it's alive, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Ezra praised the Lord the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen and amen. And then they bowed down and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This is one of the greatest worship services in history. And I pray that when we come back to Belrose Next City Church and that we have the services online, I pray that even before we get back there, that our worship would be hot again, that our, our time in the word would be powerful again, that our anointings would be strong again. Listen, he's ruffled the feathers to get you out of the nest, but what you do with it, you'll either hit the ground hard and die or you're going to fly it's time to fly it's time to move out of your comfort zone it's time to finally defeat those sins that have hamstrung you for the for your life it's time for total victory you could either use this time of quarantine as a god why did you do this to me or you could use it as a refining process that when you come out of it you'll never be the same again because we will come out of it but there will be a difference there will be those who have been trained by it and those who have been crippled by it. And I choose to be trained by it and let the Lord be my trainer. I don't want to come out of this in a wheelchair. I may be able to walk physically, but emotionally I'm in a wheelchair. I don't want to come out of this limping. I, I want to come out of this soaring because I may be walking, but I'll be limping if I allow the voice of the enemy to get root inside of me and I hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness and doubt and fear and anxiety. I'm telling you, this is your season. God's going to do it, but you've got to be available and surrendered to the process. Only gold gets refined in the fire. It's worth far more when the imperfections are taken out. But it's got to go through the heat. In John 15, it says, remain in me. Apart from me, we can do nothing. And his heart is that we will bear fruit that will last. That's the theme for this year. I'll talk a little bit about it tonight again. 
but remaining in him. Do you realize when the fruit is secure in the vine, the storms will not rip it off before it's time? If you've remained in him, you can walk through this season and you're still going to be on the vine. Because your strength and your security does not come from your own self, your money, or your resources. Your security comes from what you're connected to. You're in good hands with Allstate. I'd much rather be connected to the hands of my Savior than the hands of Allstate. Because all Allstate did was send me a $36 check to refund me for my uh, COVID stay home. $36, acting like they're going to be sending you millions of dollars. $36. Thanks for nothing, Allstate. You're in cheap hands. $36. But when you walk through the fire, he'll be with you. When you go through the waters, they will not overtake you. He's your Lord. And if there's ever a time we needed to allow him to be our shepherd, it's now. And friends, we've got to get out of this routine where we only run to Jesus when things don't make sense. And a, and a, and a virus or a terrorist attack or a personal tragedy or, or an internal struggle causes us to run to Jesus. He's not just the God of your problems. He needs to be the Lord of all. And that's what this whole time of prayer and fasting is it's a refocus he's throwing you out the nest and you can either be jaded by this process or formed by this process when it's good on the inside what manifests on the outside will be amazing a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. God desires us deeply to express our love for him. He calls us to worship him regularly. Praise and worship must be a part of our fasting. Psalm 29, 1 and 2 in the NLT. It says, honor the Lord, heavenly beings. Honor the Lord for his glory and strength. Honor the Lord for his glory of his name. Worship the Lord in despair. Of his, uh, uh, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 96, 8, 9 in the NLT says this, Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. That, that our, our prayer and fasting must not just be about reading the word, but we've got to learn how to worship. You can't just look at Dom and Genesis, and some of you may be saying, Oh, aren't they great? Aren't they talented? Oh, I like that song. And you listen to it like you listen to a song on the radio. We don't have this worship for your entertainment. We have this worship for his glory. And, and no matter who the worship leader is, no matter what the song choices are, he's God and he's greatly to be praised. And, and we've got to understand, okay, Lord, you're going to keep me out of the church? You're going to keep me from singing with the family of God? Then I'm going to sing with my family. It's got, it's got to be natural to praise God no matter who's around. And I believe one of the things God is doing in this quarantine is he's forced you to be with your family, man of God, because you've been called to be the example. Your kids will do in excess what you do in moderation. So if you could praise God, guess how far they're going to go. You want to see the example? Look at me and my son. He's going to do things. Shut your ears. Come on, put your fingers in your ears. Deep in your ears. God, I hope you clean them. He's going to do things and go places that I've never been. I see it in him. I'm not a perfect father. I am not a perfect man. I got more issues than, than I could tell you. And believe me, that will come out in a book that Dominic will write once I die. But I do know this, what they see is what they get. And I love the Lord. And if I worship just a little bit, and I can live before God, the best I can do in front of my children, and I can I cannot be so, oh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of weird, you know, singing in front of your family. <laughs> it's kind of weird wor wor worshiping God in front of your family. It's kind of weird closing your eyes when you pray in front of your family. Man of God, you're the leader of that family. 
and it's time for you to leave. Because your wife and your children take their cues from you. And I pray my kids will go further than I've ever gone because you know what? They saw Christ in me and they saw it as attractive. And they said, you know what? If we saw it in mom and dad, we're going to be able to see, uh, we want to take it further. But you got to worship. When I, hear, when I hear my son worship, I don't know where he got that voice. I can't even sing next to him. I realize how out of tune I am. Then he tells me, Dad, you sing with too much vibrato. You got to tone it down. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm living with Simon Cowell. He walks around with shirts down to his navel. It's horrible. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I just, I just look at what God has done in my family. And believe me, I'm not bragging or, 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 or he's not done with us yet. And I'm not trying to put an undue pressure on my kids. But I, 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 I'm, just tell, I'm, I'm talking openly to parents. I've seen it. My, my kids don't do sleepovers. I don't let them do sleepovers at other people's houses. They're not, they're not hooked into the PTA network. You know who their best friends are? Each other. And you know the kids that they hang out with the most are the ones at church. Luke plays baseball. He's not involved in 17 other sports. Rebecca, she's not involved in dance. You know what dance class is? Dominic playing that stupid song that he doesn't stop playing by what's her name ariana grande <laughs> right that song that's all i hear and then there's rebecca dancing like paula abdul that's her dance class luke plays baseball dominic's the president of his christian club and um and uh he's he helps out pastor kevin in the youth group and for those of you parents that say well, you know, my kid has to be more well-rounded. I'm going to tell you something. The scholarships are starting to come in based on his resume of what he's done for the Lord. I'm speaking to you parents. Everything you thought was important for your kids has been stripped away. Everything you needed to manage their success has been stripped away. Except one thing, which is the only thing that matters. It's their relationship with God. It's not about taking them to mommy and me playtimes. It's not about organizing their play dates with their friends. It's not even about the sports teams because there isn't even any sports. It's about one thing. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. It's not about your house. It's not about your job. It's not about your position. If you position yourself for the Lord, he'll put you in the right position. If you submit yourself to the Lord, if you humble yourself to the Lord, he will lift you up. And there's no better way to humble yourself to the Lord than but by prayer and fasting. And this is not about if you do this, you're going to be successful. If you do this, you're going to be the next Puff Daddy. If you do this, you're going to be the next Steve Harvey. If you do this, you're going to be the next Oprah. I can eat bread. This isn't about that. Jesus is enough. And when he becomes the object of your affection and he becomes the sole purpose of your life, then everything else follows. And by the way, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you is the end note on a section about worry. And I believe one of the things you've done through this and I've done through this is we've worried. What are we going to do with the church? What are we going to do with the kids? What's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? God's on the throne. He's either in control or he's not. Come on. Can somebody say amen? Is there anybody still with me on Facebook? Is there anybody still with me on the, web, on the website? Is there anybody still with me on Roku? What's a Roku? In verse 7, the leaders instructed the people of the law. The truth is, after 70 years, the people were more molded to the culture of their captives than they were to the culture of the Lord. You know what this COVID thing has done? It's shown us how molded we have been to the culture of our captor rather than the culture of the Lord. How much we were in tune with the American dream rather than God's dream. Everything's been taken away from us. But what it does when God ruffles the feathers and, he's, and he kicks you out the nest is that we're reprioritizing. 
You don't need all those cars. You don't need all that stuff. You don't need all those clothes. Because they ain't going to fit you after the quarantine anyway. Maybe after the fast. See? <laughs> Fasting has a purpose. Oh, yeah, I'm going to gain a notch back, and there's some jeans I cannot wait to fit into by the end of next week. Daddy's coming home. But what I'm saying is this. When, when they read the law, they couldn't understand it unless it was translated because they had adapted to the culture of their captors. And it's funny because how much has our values adopted to the culture? And we have a mix of Christianity and worldview of a secular worldview that's like this kind of like homogenized version of faith. But all that stuff's been stripped away. All the Hollywood stars can't get their hair done, their eyelashes glued on, their tans done. They can't go to the gym to work out. They can't get their liposuction and plastic surgery. <laughs> All the Hollywood stars, everything's been taken away. All the economy has been taken away. Everything is stopped. But the man and the woman who builds their house on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, when the storms of life come, when the winds of life come, when the waves come, the waves will come, but the house will still be standing on the foundation. But the foolish builder builds his house upon the sand, and when the storms come, everything is gone. Friends, what's most important is your foundation. If you build a house with a shoddy foundation, that house will fall. But only those who build their house on the foundation of Jesus will live. Amen. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Listen to this now. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will i'm here to tell you that when you pray and fast you start you start putting a block on the conforming of the world you know what it means to conform it means to mold by pressure oh but i'm saying stop to the pressure of the world and i'm saying god you transform me and renew my mind so i can know your will and then in verse 9 of nehemiah it says nehemiah the governor ezra the priest and the teacher of the law and the levites Instructed all the people to say, this day is holy to the Lord. Don't mourn or weep, for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the word of the Lord. Worship team, come on up behind me to give everyone a sense of false hope that we're ending this service. No, we're actually going to end it because uh, we're going to be back tonight at 7.30. Come on now, I want you to type in, I'll be back at 7.30. Come on, let's, 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 let's confirm it to the Lord right now. I'll be back at 7.30 and I'm fasting. I'll be back at 7.30 and I'll be fasting. Listen. Pray about your fast. Your fast needs to come from the Lord. But we're going to be back here tonight at 7.30. We're going to consecrate ourselves to the Lord. But once the people heard and understood, they started to live out the word. They felt a deep conviction and a spiritual sensitivity. You know what fasting does? It restores your spiritual taste buds. Have you ever scolded your mouth and then your tongue couldn't taste anything? Man, going through COVID-19, I lost my sense of smell and taste. Some of you have felt that too, right? And it still is not fully back. The house could have been burning down, and I wouldn't have been able to smell it. But do you know what fasting does? It brings back all of your spiritual sensitivities. And the people of God understood what God wanted. And they turned to the Lord for mercy. This fast is not about how bad we've been. This fast is about how good God is. And in Lamentations 3.21 to 26, it says, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. And I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him. To the one who sees him, it is good to wait patient, quietly for the salvation of the Lord. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. When they began to return to God, they started to realize there is no condemnation. And when we start to return to God, Romans 8, 1 and 2 becomes a reality to us. Therefore, 
there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death and they began to weep they realized what they lost but they will resolve to never lose it again one of the one of the things that God has put in my mind is the day we return back to church it's the day that you roll up to 240-15 Hillside Avenue you go to the lot and you see Louie and Jason and, and Kerry and they wish you a, a happy Sunday you come in through those double doors on Hillside you're greeted by some of the serve team carrying on the traditions of Naomi and Gloria you walk into the church and you you smell the building again for the first time and then instead of just seeing some of the worship team you see the whole worship team you see the camera operators the sound technicians you see the ushers the greeters and the hospitality you sit down in that seat for the first time and you feel that gray Italian suit fabric that we got on those chairs you see the sign light up the cross lit up above and there's a lot of things that seem similar but there's a difference that you sense in the air the difference is not going to be in the aesthetics the difference is not going to be in the fact that we have a worship team or that there's camera operators the difference will be in the worship team in the camera operators in the pastor and in the people worshiping in the pews in the ushers in the greeters in the nurses in the kids ministry with Sunday Steve and all day Althea there we go I don't know I need to come up with something for you Althea proud of you guys for holding the children's ministry down but there'll be a difference because we understood what we lost and we resolved to never lose it again but what we lost was not the ability to come into the church we took for granted worshiping together we took our Christianity too lightly we took for granted serving the Lord there's a difference when you've been through war and you survived you appreciate things a lot more there's a difference when you've been through the crushing and the breaking that God allows you to go through you come back remember what we talked about from my living room and one of those services where we couldn't even be here that the olive is crushed but through the crushing it's worth more and when it's worth more it's not worth more so it could be put on a shelf so that it could be poured out there's everybody who wants anointing there's everybody who wants greatness there's everybody who wants the the the, the anointed family there's everybody that wants the anointed ministry there's everybody that wants success there's everybody that wants to you know fulfill their destiny but you cannot fulfill destiny you cannot have anointing and you cannot reach your full potential without enduring discipline without going through hardship and without being crushed the difference is you can either go through it with a shepherd or you can go through it on your own those who go through it on their own fizzle out and die but those who go through it with the good shepherd <laughs> I'm gonna read it to you right now Psalm 23 come on turn there with me this is how we need to go through the rest of this COVID-19 this is how we need to go through the rest of our life the Lord is my shepherd I shall not be in want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters he restores my soul how is your soul what's going on in here how many hours have you been sleeping yet you're still weary how many hours are you sleeping at night and waking up late the next day because you don't have to worry about necessarily being at work at a certain time as long as you get your work done how many hours do you sleep a day and yet your soul is weary when you have a shepherd no matter what you go through he will give you rest for your soul he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows and surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever last thing I'll tell you is this 
For those of you that are saying, God, why did this happen to me? Sometimes you need to be broken so that you can learn to trust God. When it says your rod and your staff, they comfort me, I want you to think of a sheep that uh, is, is not trusting the shepherd. That every time the shepherd gives the command to go left, that sheep goes right. And that every time that, that shepherd says, okay, here's the water that you're going to drink from, you got that sheep refusing to drink from the water because that sheep does not trust the shepherd. So what the shepherd does, once again, cover your ears, you animal lovers. But what the shepherd does is he will take his staff and he will break the leg of the sheep. Now, he will not do that because he's mad at the sheep. He's not going to do that because the sheep offended him. He's going to do that because he understands that if that sheep is going to live and not be attacked by predators, if that sheep is going to reach its full destination and be profitable to the master, if that sheep is going to fulfill its destiny as a sheep, if it's going to be safe and protected under the care, if it goes off by itself because of a lack of trust for the shepherd, it will surely die. So he has to break the leg. And remember you've ever seen those, those pictures of the Jesus carrying the sheep in the Sunday school? Right? Come on, Jesus carrying the sheep? Well, what they don't tell you about that picture is the reason that the shepherd carries the sheep is because he just broke his leg from, from not trusting the command of the shepherd. And so what the shepherd will do is he will bandage the leg, he will set the bone right, and for the whole journey, he will carry that sheep on his shoulders. And when the sheep is on his shoulders, all of a sudden the sheep realizes the tone, the nature, the kindness, the protection the provision of the shepherd he sees firsthand what he used to assume from afar and he gets a totally different view of the shepherd now when that leg heals the shepherd puts the sheep down and that sheep will be the closest one to him not the furthest one from him no matter where that shepherd goes that sheep will be the most loyal sheep the most trusted sheep the most secure sheep the ones on the fringe will get picked off but that sheep will never ever fall because it's learned through the process of breaking of crushing of discipline of hardship you don't learn the voice of God when everything is great you learn the voice of God when you're on your knees and you're praying for your father-in-law or you're praying for your wife or you're praying for your children or you're praying for what once was and you say God why would you break me this way and that's exactly when God puts you on your shoulders and he starts to walk with you that's exactly what he wants to do this week in this fast he wants to break us down put us on his shoulders and walk with us for this week and if you do you will learn God's heart. You will learn God's voice. You will learn God's ways. You will learn God's heart. You will learn God's provision. You will learn God's protection. You will learn, understand God's direction. And you will know who you are because you spent the week on the shoulders of the shepherd. But in order to do that, you got to say to King's stomach, not today. You got to take a break for a week. You'll live. You'll live without food. Your mind and your stomach will play games on you. You can do it because you're doing it for God. I want everyone to make an altar right now. We're going to pray.